thank you so much uh, for having me in this forum to talk about practices for improving accessibility and inclusion in field laboratory and computational science. Um, I know I'm part of conversation five here. Um, and the first conversation was really about intersectionality, disability, and diversity. And then conversations two through four were about best practices for accessibility, first in laboratory se settings, then in field studies, and then in computational work. I appreciate the work of these prior sessions um, to focus on these topics. But how do we put all of these things together in thinking about access to careers in all their facets and their stages, and into recruiting and retaining disabled talent um, disabled researchers, disabled scientists um, in the work that we do, while also recognizing that people can become disabled during their lives. So this is also about keeping and engaging in scientific research and science work um, over our lifetimes too. My title here is The Dream, which is to say, uh, my title is Access at Every Stage. Uh, which is the dream for, for all of the sciences um, in terms of disability and inclusion, and indeed beyond, to have access at every stage, to be able to go through education and career steps and not encounter barrier after barrier to your own participation, enjoyment, and enjoyment and inclusion. The flip side is that this talk might also be called barriers at every stage, which is how it can feel for people working through the accommodations process or wondering about disclosure, or having to creatively hack their own careers um, in terms of accommodations, um, and then to be pushed back upon by, by artificial ideas about who belongs, right? Because often there's an assumption that if you're too disabled, you do not belong. The title could also then be wanting to belong in science or wanting to be, to be able to be in science, engineering and medicine, to be, and to be without struggle that access and accommodation often currently uh, represent. Um, so who am I to be talking about this work? Well, my work, um, weirdly, uh, for the National Academies um, and to be a speaker here, my work is about stories and storytelling and the narratives we tell about disabled people, particularly in relationship to technology. Uh, typically, when we see news and entertainment stories about disability, um, they set up technology as helping disabled people overcome their disabilities. Uh, but stories from the disability community and from disabled people themselves aren't like this. They don't tell the story. Or if they do, it's far more nuanced. A technology might play a role in helping a person adapt. Um, it may be something that's a constant source of uh, the need for maintenance and repair. Um, it might be something that helps um, in some aspects, but it's not the sort of cure-all that it's pictured as in a lot of our news and entertainment stories. I fear that this story seeps into how people think about accommodations, um, that you get this thing, this accommodation or this technology, and things are magically transformed, right? We're always told that technology is life-changing for people with disabilities. Our, stories usually aren't about that, but this is the general perception. So, and here I'll use the terminology of Tanya Tichkowski, T-A-N-Y-A-T-I-T-C-H-K-O-W-S-K-Y, uh, where she talks about includable, right? That so much of the ableist environment that we're in demands that disabled people change themselves, function in particular ways to be worthy of being included. And that's sometimes how people think about accommodations. Well, if a disabled person is worthy enough, has uh, normalized themselves enough, then they might be includable. And you can imagine how this flows in, thinking about uh, Dr. O O's first keynote here, uh, where he talks about um, intersectionality and who fits um, in terms of who gets to be includable. I want space. Um, so I'm, I'm working in a department of science, technology, and society. I work with humanists and social scientists. Um, but we look at the things scientists and engineers are doing. And my training is in philosophy of technology with a specific focus on technology and disability. I currently am working under a National Science Foundation career grant number 
1750260, although this work does not represent the opinions of the National Science Foundation. Um, but I'm thinking a lot about disability community work later, lately. I want a space for us to be proudly disabled in all the places we are for work and life, uh, to be able to disclose disabilities at work without fear, and to get what we need even when we can't disclose or when there is no clear label to disclose, right? Not everyone has the diagnosis they need to access um, accommodations. We also need systemic change to how we approach the business of disability more generally. That is the processes at work in our workplaces as scientists. I think this is particularly imperative in the sciences, engineering and medicine, where non-disabled people have often been cast as experts about disabled people. Um, in ways that often reemphasize overcoming stories. Um, and a lot of the work of science, technology, um, um, and, and medicine is about um, addressing disability in various ways. So having disabled researchers um, is incredibly important uh, to getting what we're doing right, to serving the people we want to serve correctly, to being in solidarity with uh, disabled people around us. Um, and here's where it gets tricky because disability is an identity as well as a community, as well as a social construct about how we frame and think about the world and how we sort people. The category itself, disability, points to a wide array of people with a lot of different neurologies, body configuration, injuries, and conditions. Many of us who are disabled are multiply disabled. We also have people from every other category of identity you can think of. So it's important to plan for disabled people to be, to be here, to be, to exist in these spaces without harm and without extra labor beyond what non-disabled people encounter. So let's talk about this current approach to the business of disability. And I recognize that my talk is going to be a lot about accommodations in ways um, that I maybe didn't expect when I started writing down my ideas for this talk, in fact. Um, so I need to say some things and probably some mean things, unkind things about accommodations because our mindset around disability inclusion is often, well, those people have accommodations or we can make accommodations and then, ta-da, we've included them. The accommodations mindset is one where if pe disabled people show up or if you become disabled, it's a surprise and you then have to make a request to be included. And that request isn't a simple process. So in fact, if you would like an accommodation, first you have to identify barriers to your participation, right? You have to know what the problem is um, in, in, in the environment you're encountering. Sometimes, you know, it's a physical barrier and something you can literally point to, there's no ramp into this building. Um, other times, sometimes, you know, the way work is set up can be part of the barrier, right? The physical environment is part of it, but sometimes it's the flow of work. Sometimes it's, you know, a barrier to participation can be that it's really unclear what a process should be. So once you've identified a barrier to your participation, then, in fact, in most workplaces, um, you are asked to get the appropriate documentation to show that you're worthy of this accommodation, that it's an appropriate accommodation. And that usually involves a physician signing off. And of course, it's assumed that you have a physician, that they believe you, and that they will fill out the paperwork to help you get an accommodation. Not everyone has access, of course, to uh, primary care or the sort of documentation that they may ask for from specialists um, if it comes to specific disability types. And of course, then once you've identified the barriers, once you've gotten this appropriate documentation, which is not an easy process in a lot of cases, um, then you are expected to present your documentation to the proper authority, possibly a disability services office or a human resources department, and hopefully they will know what to do uh, when you approach them and ask for these things. Um, and then it usually initiates a conversation between the authority. So the certification authority, whether it's disability services or HR, um, the person who is your direct supervisor and any supervisors that they have um, um, are possibly part of the mix and you 
This is called the interactive process. And then, then you can work to fix whatever barrier it is, uh, whether it's you know, the need for screen reading software, um, if you need to rest your eyes for longer periods of time, uh, whether it's a nearby facility to work in, right? It's You can't get to the place, especially for people who are newly disabled. This is something that can be really disoriented. It's harder to get where you were going. Um, it could be a nearby parking spot if you experience a lot of fatigue um, or proximity to public transportation. It could be the ability to come into work later or do telework. Um, and you know, even simple things like the permission to sit down on the job are part of what, you know, constitutes, uh, you know, an accommodation in these cases. And then you can get that one thing changed. You go through this whole process and you're given permission to get the one thing that you identified as a barrier changed. Now, hopefully you have a larger conversation, but you're not always sent to having a larger accommodation about what accommodations you might need in the future. And in fact, a lot of disability resource offices are not, are not really wanting to talk to you about accommodations you'll need in the future. They want to talk about the state you're in now and what you need at the moment, which then there can be delays. Um, if you have a progressive disability, this is really frustrating. You would like a way to have seamless transitions as you need more supports put in place um, that would help you work better. Anyway, so you've gotten through all of this red tape and you get the one thing changed, whatever may, may be that allows you to be, to be included, but only be included in very specific terms where you have had to navigate an often hostile process, the paperwork, authority, bosses, and just simple expectations of work that people may be unwilling to be flexible on constitute extra steps to being places, to being in science, and to being in research. And this is a process that unless if you are disabled, you are never really like privy to. You don't see all the steps it takes, the doctor's visits to get bio-certified in, 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 in the terms that Ellen Samuels talks about. Accommodations mean that you can be here and can be included, but only if we make alternate arrangements for you. It's where you get called special and don't call us that, by the way. Accommodations mean you'll be asked to prove yourself worthy, to be disabled enough, to be documented enough, meaning that you know what your disability is. Accommodations mean extra work for institutions who have set up this network, this stages of paperwork and things, um, as well as for individual people going through the process. Accommodations are also the basement in terms of access and inclusion. They sometimes allow temporary access to a job or program. And this assumes it's all gone well, has moved efficiently, and where you are trusted about your disability status. This doesn't mean that disabled people hate accommodations. It means that accommodations don't structurally change anything. They don't make science more inclusive. They don't open the gates of the academy for us. They don't make lasting changes to the way we as researchers and colleagues go about our business. There's no change to access and inclusion when everything is one-off accommodations. You probably want a story at this point, since I said I study stories. So gather around asynchronous viewers. Um, I was once asking one of my crit mentors about how she got accommodated at work, how it was when she arrived at her current institution. And she told me about arriving at her new job where she, someone with an apparent physical disability, uh, needed some particular voice to text software so that she could type essentially to write all the papers and write up all the research and take notes and let's just say the software was important to her work and she presented her documentation to the ada unit uh, before she even arrived um, in human resources at the time and they agreed that she needed that software and then started a process of months of back and forth where she had to repeatedly inquire about the software, when it would be ordered, how to get it on her computer, uh, which unit would be paying for the software. And this is where things got held up significantly, where there was no plan for how to pay for the software package she needed. She was an up and coming star in her field at the time. Um, and, and she was incredibly slowed down. Her department chair had been copied actually on a lot of this communication. And after months of her chair watching this communication, um, you know, they had a discussion and this researcher, um, of course, had a startup package, but that money is not supposed to be spent on assistive technology. And you can think about how that might 
you know, put disabled researchers um, behind their peers when they have to pay for their assistive technology and not the things they need to do their experiments. Um, and the chair, to this chair's great credit, recognized that this delay in getting the new faculty member a necessary work tool was going to impact her ability to write and publish. The chair intervened and had the department administrator pay for the software from the department budget so that her new faculty member could get on with her research. No more going back and forth between units about the software and who might pay, no more discussion of it at all. This was for an accommodation that everyone agreed was appropriate and which was well documented and kind of obvious um, given her the physical nature of her disability. And for something not really all that uncommon, voice to text software is a pretty standard accessibility tool. It took about nine months into her new job as a tenure track faculty member for her to finally have that software. So when we talk about this extra labor um, and the extra time the accommodations process takes. We're looking at, we're looking at delaying people in their careers in a significant way. So we often talk about the leaky pipeline uh, when we talk about like other minority uh, groups. But this is one where we can see where disabled people always start behind because of this accommodations mindset. The thing is this, what my, what my colleague encountered was not an uncommon situation. And she was in a good position with a chair who was paying attention and who didn't say, well, we shouldn't have to pay for that and go back and forth with uh, assistive tech and HR some more. Um, I, she was in a relatively good position, right, as a tenure track faculty member. Not everyone can disclose like she did. And in, I know graduate students who have had to retake, retake to get, retake testing um, to get the documentation they need in order to be certified for, with services for students with disabilities. Um, and to get that testing, uh, it took six months to get the testing and it costs $3,000 to get the educational testing she need, needed for a diagnosis she had had since she was five. She bombed her first semester in her engineering program because she didn't have the, the accommodations that she knew she needed, that she had been certified in the past as needing. And once she got the accommodations in place, she was a great engineering student. But the sort of lag, the extra certification, I know her GPA isn't what she would want it to be because it doesn't actually reflect her abilities. You know, giving, uh, getting for her a little bit more time on tests, like makes a huge difference to her being able to, to take those tests, getting more flexibility on time really mattered. Um, but she was held up, waylaid in a way so many people are. And, and this is where leaks often occur in this pipeline. Um, and this is often the case for disabled students and researchers, but we're usually not tracked by university diversity initiatives. Our departures aren't witnessed. People burn out from seeking accommodations or from being afraid of, of doing so because of what it will take. And always having the extra work of inclusion foisted back onto them as disabled people. I think sometimes about how it can feel to be held back on purpose because of some of the barriers of work. Many disabled feel, people feel like they're caught in a loop when it comes to accommodations processes, especially if you have disabilities that are variable, right? So it's not constant. Sometimes you can do some things, sometimes you can do other things. I think about people with pain flare-ups that shape their days, um, but lots of disabilities are, are variable, even as an amputee, if my, if my hardware breaks, if my leg breaks, I have to truck out to my prosthetist, make sure he has the time, get fixed up. I think about just the time it takes in terms of variability, just with something, you know, even if it doesn't cause me physical pain, what it means to get back on track when I'm, I'm way late by maintenance. Um, and this accommodations loop um, is what, this is the term used by Margaret Price, M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T-P-R-I-C-E and others who have worked on what's called the Disabled Faculty Study. I wanna talk about this study for just a little bit. Um, it is about all sorts of faculty, not about science researchers particularly, but I think it has um, a lot of good observations um, about how faculty are encountering different processes in our workplaces. And that includes 
of course, scientific researchers as well. Um, so this is a study that's been conducted um, over, over eight years now. Um, as disabled researchers working on disabled projects, um, they, they took a different view of how they were going to structure and have a timeline for the research. So this study is led by Margaret Price, Stephanie Kirchbaum at Delaware, Mark Salzer and Amber O'Shea at Temple. It involved anonymous surveys and semi-structured interviews, and it sampled for maximum variability, meaning they wanted diversity um, in their semi-structured interviews. Um, so they recruited um, interviewees um, for diversity. Um, and they had themes of themes that keep coming up for, for the people they're talking to are issues of disclosure, like negotiating whether you tell people you're disabled and how and when. Um, accommodations process, and that's, of course, what I'm focused on, the experience of space and time, and this isn't unrelated um, to the accommodations process, as might be apparent from my stories just a moment ago, um, and then, then looking at um, different forms of support, the nature of barriers, and differences in experience between different groups of disabled people, and Margaret Price um, has written, and she has this piece, um, Time Harms, and, and she says, although accommodations are often referred to as measures that level the playing field, this metaphor represents a dangerous misrepresentation. Close study of the accommodations loop, her term, shows why. The loop is arduous to traverse, must be traversed over and over again, and exacts, exacts costs, not only of time and money, but also of emotion. The loop must be traversed by anyone seeking accommodations, whether they are quickly granted or fiercely contested. And perhaps most important, the loop is almost always invisible to those not traversing it. She talks about the need of constant labor and biocertification, that documentation. And then when people leave, drop out, the loop just closes. We see a disappearance of both the need for the accommodation, the disabled person, and any trace of its history. This is not structural change that we're seeing. She also talks about how institutional, and here I quote, institutional discourses suggest that waiting for an accommodation is a value neutral event. It might be inconvenient or frustrating, but if the accommodation is eventually forthcoming, and if everyone has good intentions, no real harm is done. I argue that we must counter this assumption by recognizing a basic law of crip space time. Time can cause harm. And this is her title, Time Harms. Um, so what can we do when we think about our current situation with access and inclusion and how many people think accommodations are, are how we should manage um, disability? Um, a, you're gonna lose a lot of disabled people if accommodations are the process. Not all of us have clear diagnoses. Not all of us can get documentation. What we need um, in some ways is to crip the sciences. And to crip is a term um, that is, so crip is a word being reclaimed in the disability community like queer is. And you see different people talking in queer studies about queering things. This is a similar term in disability studies about cripping things. Um, and Margaret Price, of course, was talking about crip space time. Uh, Elian Samuels has also written a lot about crip time. And it's about this sort of acceptance of disability and expectation that disability will be part of where we are, what we go, how we plan, and a sort of flexibility and approach to how we think about time in the case of crip time. This, I think, when we're talking about cripping the sciences, um, we often have an idea that things are supposed to look one way, right? That research follows a very clear path or plan. Um, but even within the sciences, there's a great diversity, of course, in, in how science proceeds. And there's no one perfect way to be, even if that's what we often think. And what eugenic rhetoric has seeped into our brains and check sheets that we should look particular ways. We need to be open to honoring more ways of being. Sometimes that means changing our pacing and our clocks and being more forgiving in terms of the attitude we have towards timing. So crip, as in crip time, our clocks move differently, sometimes very quickly or sometimes intensely. Honestly, this shift can cohere with how we think about research projects too. Um, I think about what this means in my own work uh, with other disabled faculty 
we have a disabled faculty writing group this year at my university that I'm part of. Uh, we have check-ins each week on a Google Doc. An opportunity is given to write together on Zoom because, of course, we have immunocompromised people and we're not leaving anyone out. Um, and we won't be writing it all in person this year because of, of the ongoing COVID-19 situation. Um, but we're checking in on each other, checking in on writing, but also checking in on sort of the barriers we're encountering and, and working with one another. I think cripping the sciences also like speaks to the flexibility that we see in the universal design movement and universal design for learning. And it's really about fitting education, careers and institutions for a wider variety of humans, not asking disabled people to bend or break to preconceived molds. Of course, this is beneficial beyond the disability community um, and what we call the curb cut effect, right? Curb cuts are used by wheelchair users, but they're also used by uh, people who have dollies and strollers and other wheeled implements um, um, to get around in various locations. Um, they work for more than just the disability community. And what I'm suggesting is when we crip the sciences, um, it will do that too. I think also of the way in which cripping the sciences means letting disabled people work against some of the things we've been doing wrong in the sciences and allowing critique where disabled people are not well regarded within science. I think of the way in which Purdue's Ruo Williams, R-U-A-W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S, critiques the field of human computer interaction and specifically robot development aimed at autism interventions. Sometimes the experiments she critiques literally scare children. But the researchers who are describing how the children react don't necessarily realize that that is a scared response from autistic children like Rua um, and other autistic researchers can. It may mean that we have to shift avenues of research when we recognize harms to disabled people. We have to also think about institutional uh, change in terms of taking the opportunities we're given to make things more accessible and disability friendly. Um, I think of Martina Swantek's work, M-A-R-T-I-N-A-S-V-Y-A-N-T-E-K. Uh, I think about her work on my own campus, which sticks out to me here. Dr. Swantek did a deep dive for her graduate work on institutional policy documents over 25 to 30 years here, where accessibility seemed to be an afterthought. And indeed, um, we were going to master planning sessions um, for the current situation, like, like a few years ago. And even the master planning sessions where they said they were soliciting feedback from the community were often in inaccessible spaces with bad acoustics. At one point, Martina was attending a session and she had to stand because all of the seating was on like stools that could move around. Um, and for lots of people in the disability community, high stools that move around are going to hurt your back, um, impact your um, sense of balance. There's lots of reasons because high stools are a bad thing. Um, and, and, and ironically, she was also reading all of these past master planning documents. And every one of them mentions the sentiment. And in fact, she is back to 1983. The master planning document mentions that all new construction should be working to make things more accessible, not less. And 30 plus years later, we, we were still seeing this in action. Even as they were soliciting feedback, it was clear that they hadn't thought about disabled audiences. And earlier in that year, Dr. Swantek and I had participated together with our campus disability group in an event to draw attention to newly constructed steps to replace old steps where they had the opportunity to like knock down several buildings, they rebuilt those buildings, the steps were supposed to go through and there were no ramps that they installed. The way around the building was actually blocked for a long period of time by construction fences, no way to get through um, um, if you're a wheelchair user or if you can't do steps. Um, you would actually have to go into a different building hoping the building was open at the time you needed to traverse first campus and use an elevator. Um, and this is still mostly how we access that space because the pathway along the accessible route is so much longer. I'm still, and this was a few years ago, um, they made decisions. They didn't take opportunities to make things more accessible even though they keep talking about this commitment. We also have to think about flexibility and use. This is one of the principles of universal design, uh, but it's something we need to elevate 
in value, especially as we design laboratory spaces and research projects. When you think about the variety of people you could have work on a project, we should think about how, how to make these things more flexible for use by different types of people. That means some structural, um, by which I mean physical structure um, changes to laboratories at times, um, um, but also thinking about this in terms of programmatic work. And we should be listening to those doing the feminist work of complaint. This is a term from Sarah Ahmed um, around disability issues in our research spaces um, um, in our program. So when it comes to programmatic barrier removal, we have to think about how we do prelims and comprehensive exams for, for advanced degrees. How we do this matters. Are there multiple ways to do it or only one route? So I think about this with particular students who have encountered this barrier and might not have been able to get accommodations. We can build programs that allow exams to be taken in multiple ways. So many times our comprehensive or preliminary exams involve sitting for eight hours a day, five days a week for two weeks to sit and answer questions. I've thought about, you know, I, I encourage my students, not even my disabled students, all students to negotiate like what it is going to look like to do their exams. There's some flexibility um, in the program that, that I'm part of because we have a lot of non-traditional students um, you know, with families and day jobs. So we can't always structure prelims and comprehensive exams, assuming people have two weeks to sit quietly in a room. Um, and, and, and there have been times um, when we've restructured instead of two weeks in a room, it's there are three sections to the prelims in my department, but this exists for a lot of different programs. We do a section at a time with breaks in between. It's the same questions, the same amount of time, just divided out specifically on your question areas. It doesn't change any of the rigor of the exam, but it allows for more people to do the work, which is ideally what we want to make things accessible and inclusive. It's not, it's not that any requirement has been changed unless if the requirement was a physical tech test of whether you can sit in a room that's not really what we want um right um and i i think we also have to ask ourselves what are we requiring in terms of legwork i think about all of the extra um steps to paperwork to different degrees and various work processes that can be simplified We're, we shouldn't ask for more information than we need we think about this in our scientific research when we do survey methods, um, but we can think about this and turn it inward on the work we do. Our, our, you know, what are we requiring? Are there forms that can be simplified, processes and paperwork, not even just disability paperwork, that can be simplified? Um, and also, is there like a clear map for people on which paperwork happens when? I often find that this is where students who are coming up in the sciences struggle, um, particularly students with disabilities who, have may, who may have executive dysfunction, and filling out paperwork itself, right? They're doing their good engineering work, they're doing their good science work, but filling out these forms that they'll encounter once each, um, you know, can present an extra barrier. So I often ask my colleagues, like, can you fill out the paperwork? Can you set up the assistive tech? Do you know how? Do you know how to book your ASL interpreter? Do you know how to get Braille ordered? If you have someone requesting Braille, do you know which offices to even go to? How, how do you figure out these things, right? This, this is the work we're always placing back on disabled people, but it belongs in our hands as um, administrators, as um, supervisors, as mentors to be ready for these things too. I have literally filled out the paperwork for a number of disabled students who just couldn't finish paperwork. I see the paperwork a lot as someone who serves on, on various committees and it doesn't cost me nearly the time it will them and the time and stress of, of filling out that paperwork and it's easy, right? The barrier is one that was unnecessary to begin with. It doesn't change anything about what the students knows or whether they're a good scientific researcher. I also think about this, and this is my last slide, um, about mentoring and community in the disability uh, world. We exist better with rich disability communities as a reference and a resource to know how to navigate processes to sympathize with one another, to laugh at hilarious stories um, and have the, laugh, the release of laughter with one another when we're encountering ridiculous situations. Um, it's a place to engage in cross-disability understanding and solidarity with others. The Disabled Artists Collective Sins Invalid talks about how none of us lead one issue lives 
And so our community shouldn't just be about disability when we gather as disabled people, but all sorts of barriers that people encounter. And mentorship in the disability community looks different. It comes in different directions. For me, I acquired most of my disabilities when I was 30. I'm a hard of hearing chemo brained amputee with Crohn's disease and tinnitus. I'll let the sign language interpreter catch up. Um, um, uh, you know, bingo, I've got the card. Um, um, and most of these disabilities I acquired at age 30. And one of my early disability mentors, like into what it was like to be disabled as a professional, to be on campus, uh, was someone who had became disabled many years before me, but was also an advanced PhD student in another department and a little bit younger than me actually. Um, with her and others, we formed this Disability Alliance and Caucus on our campus, and I was learning from students and staff members at the time who were my elders in terms of being disabled. You can be a much younger person and be a disabled elder and mentor um, in ways that speak to crip time and crip space that we already diverge from normal constructs of time. We're out of time even when it comes to mentorship and advising sometimes too. This can be hard for newly disabled people to take advice from people they see as junior or lower to them in a hierarchy. Uh, but when it comes to learning the lay of the land in which the land may be newly hostile to you, this is an incredibly important part of our community and a way to think about how we mentor each other as disabled people, as researchers. I know when I became disabled, I thought very seriously about quitting my job. Every time I came to campus, it was so hard to get to my building. My building doesn't have an elevator. I was moved downstairs. So every time I went to my office, which I had partially moved into and started unpacking, and then they change up space in my department and I was still too sick to come in. I was on medical leave for a while. And they told me I, the office I had just moved into was, being, was gonna be taken by another department and they had a different office to move me into. And one of my graduate students packed up my whole office and moved it to the other office at that point. Um, the kindness, um, a shout out to Keith. Um, um, the kindness that was shown in that, um, but it was hard. I was also young enough as a disabled person that I was stared at on campus, right? I was on double crutches, um, I was bald, right? And most of my disabilities were uh, acquired uh, due to cancer and chemotherapy. Um, and it was just a completely hostile and new world. And I was lucky to have a few other disabled people on campus, Martina Swantek, uh, Jenny Dick Mosher, um, who, um, you know, it was the PhD student in another department who was filling me in on how to do things here. And this was even outside of accommodations. This was just to go to my office. Um, and I think a lot of people, uh, you know, dealing with the slog, it's really important to understand that other people are facing that too. And to have different hacks around that they've thought about and to be learning from one another. And I'm still learning uh, from the disability community. Uh, from Dr. O, uh, from other people um, where I am and at other campuses. Um, and it's really important to keep paying attention even to each other as we do disability work. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, I look really forward to doing this less asynchronously um, and, and having a discussion with uh, some of you um, now, um, if you're watching this um, in, in two weeks. All right, uh, thank you so much. Oh, and I'll give you my slides um in the chat when we're actually live together but i have a whole bunch of resources um at the end of this slideshow uh with links um in case if anyone uh, wants to delve further on any of these issues thank you so much <laughs>